welcome everybody. Um, I thought this year we would try and do a little uh, bar camp type of thing. So we'd kind of self-organize what topics we wanted to talk about and uh, um, get some feedback from the community and some more information and uh, ideas and so forth. Uh, if you look at the pinned HackMD document there, uh, it kind of has uh, information on uh, on how we want to do this. Um, so for the next 15 minutes, we'll probably do voting and organization stuff. Um, there's uh, right now five topics in there. And we've kind of, so far, we voted for uh, six 15-minute topics. So we actually have another slot there that's available for, for something else without even voting uh, for things. Um, so I'd love to see some more topics. Uh, I did also put some topics, suggested topics in the flock ticket, which I can dig up. Uh, I mean, I can think of tons of them. We, we have no th lack of things to talk about, that's for sure. Yep. Uh, thank you, Maxwell. That's it. Um, so if anybody has a topic that they'd like to, to go over, please feel free to add it to the HackMD, or if you have permissions issues or whatever, just let us know and uh, we'll get it in there. Uh, <laughs> excellent. Um, also, I was kind of thinking uh, if when we're discussing something, if you have just a, a, a quick thing to add, you can go ahead and add it in the chat. But if you have something longer to say or you want to... Uh, be more involved in the discussion or whatever, we can certainly add more people in. I have no problem with that. As many people, the more the merrier, uh, as long as we make sure that we uh, give everybody equal time to, to uh, chime in. Um, yeah, it seems see. the limit is 50 people. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah, it'd be good to see faces of people if they do want to say some stuff. It's nice to kind of, you don't get that in the virtual conferences as much, so it is good to see you if you can. Exactly, yep. Um, so if you, yeah, if you want to see a particular talk, you can put an X, uh, a vote next to it. Um, but like I said, we, right now we, uh, we have more, more uh, talks than slots, so. <laughs> Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome. I voted for big plans. The future plan. That should be a fun one. <laughs> yeah. I've got some ideas, but I'm very curious to see what everybody else thinks. <laughs> yeah, and feel free to actually put anything into questions. If you have any questions for Fedora Infran or Relange. I have should we, uh, well, should we share the HackMD document here too? Or I can share it. Okay. Sorry, Alexander, I think you had a question there, did you? No, I, I just wanted to advocate for the topic more <laughs> because <laughs> I, I often feel like when, when we talk on infrastructure, we're focusing on like problems and current uh, workflows and like uh, how to support people better. But I, I wish we also think on, on is it from a position of like, we're not just serving the infrastructure, we're also developing it and we should have our own ideas where we want to go, no, no, not just as a response to the external requests. But this, uh, that's why I'm interested in hearing more about that. Yeah, we're very, in general, we're very reactive instead of proactive. And I think it being more proactive would really, really help a, a lot yeah. of things. <laughs> Probably reduce the need to be so reactive, I would say. So we got uh, just a few more minutes of voting and adding. <clears throat> yeah. For now, it seems that the onboarding one is 
uh, is the winning. Let me see. I can. I will refer it. <laughs> yep. Seven. Yeah. Yeah. It has the most X. Uh, one other thing I was uh, going to try and do is if we could get somebody to like be a secretary for each each little section and kind of as we're going write notes in the hack and D that would be very helpful. I can do that if you want. Try. Uh, well, I was hoping uh, to get a different person for each section so that like somebody leading doesn't have to do the notes and. There, yeah. You can decide for each of the sections. Or if anybody wants to add them at themselves to HackMD, feel free to do it. I just added a general Q&A one there, but hopefully someone will add a more interesting topic. Still seems that the winning one is the onboarding improvement ideas. Is it possible to open up to HackMD so people without a HackMD account can edit it? I'm not actually sure. Yeah, if it it is. should be. I have only a HackMD account and nothing else. I and mean, I'm... there's not a HackMD account that's any sign on. Uh, it allows Google sign on, it allows other sign in options, so you don't have to specifically register for HackMD there. Okay. Just to make sure we can leave everyone contribute. So we had that we'll do introductions in this time as well. So do we want to introduce ourselves for anyone who doesn't know us? I suppose it makes sense. Sure. Um, I'll go first. So, so my name is Mark O'Brien, uh, I'm based in Ireland. Um, I started on Fedora about two and a half years ago, I'd say. Uh, I'm a Red Hat employee as well, so I work full time on Fedora infrastructure and CentOS infrastructure as well. Um, I work fairly closely with Kevin, uh, found out to his wisdom most of the time. Um, yeah, that's about it. Uh, sysadmin, I'm in the sysadmin main, most of my experience is sysadmin, very little development experience, but um, yeah, that's about it. So if Say, so Kevin, you want to go next? Uh, sure. I'm uh, <clears throat> Kevin Finzi. I've been working uh, for Red Hat for about 10 years now uh, on Fedora infrastructure. And then probably the 10 years before that, I was a community member working on Fedora infrastructure. So <laughs> I've been around a really long time. Um, but uh, I like to think that I'm not uh, too set in my ways. I like to try new things. If we think of something that is a good idea or seems like it would be a good idea, I'm, I'm happy to try it. Um, and I'm uh, Nurek on IRC and uh, Matrix, if, uh, if you frequent those places. Um, I do a lot with release engineering also. Uh, just try and keep everything uh, rolling along. Uh, Mikhail? OK. so. My name is Michal Konečný. I'm part of uh, community platform engineering team and infra team as well. Uh, I work as a developer on some apps. Recently, I got uh, I got my access to sysadmin main, so now I can actually mess up with anything. Uh, and uh, I'm. Uh, working as a agile practitioner for uh, infra and ranch team in fedora so this is something i do as well and if anybody is wondering about the head it's 
kind of something that I'm I'm doing for the releasemonitoring.org. I'm I'm working as a mage on releasemonitoring.org, and yeah, this is uh, if you read any blog post from about the releasemonitoring.org, you can see why I have it. It's partially Fedora because it has the blue and the white, so. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's more a magical hat okay i think this is all about me uh, um, alexander would you like to give a quick uh, bio even though you're not an infrastructure person but you're here yeah i kind of decided to jump in <laughs> i'm uh, actually a ci engineer for fedora rel and center stream we focus on rel mostly but also center stream so i'm kind of representing the users of the infrastructure on from from that side with heavy users of we built uh, and, and uh, release engineering infrastructure and i'm um, looking for new ideas yeah Okay. All right. Shall we dive into the first uh, most visited topic, which I guess is onboarding? Yeah. Yep. Sounds good. Uh, can somebody take notes? Okay. Mark, do you want to do it or? Yeah, I'll do the first one. I'll just put it okay. Okay. To um, so let me uh, really quickly just kind of give folks um, a little bit of information about how our onboarding works now or how it's expected to work now. And maybe I'll give uh, a few problems that we have with it now and then uh, let other folks jump in to see, you know, if they have ideas on how to improve it or re revamp it completely. Um, so right now uh, we onboard folks uh, usually in our meetings or on our mailing list. Uh, they'll come in and say, hey, we want to help work on infrastructure stuff. Uh, at that point, we'll usually add them to our apprentice group, and that gives them access to log into a whole bunch of machines uh, and look at things. Um, it gives them um, just read-only ability to, to get to host. They don't have sudo. They don't have you know, anything like that, but they can actually log in, they can look at stuff, they can see what processes are running and how things are put together. Um, we have some documentation that kind of goes over the process. And I think that's one of the places where we're really bad. Our documentation is not very good. It used to be on the wiki and it kind of got moved to docs.fedoraproject.org, but it really didn't get reworked. So it's kind of fragmented. Um, uh, after somebody joins as an apprentice, usually they will ask, you know, what, what can they do? And we'll try and give them uh, easy fix tickets, which are tickets that we've marked as being a newcomer friendly type of thing. Uh, unfortunately, often we don't have very many of those. Um, most things require some kind of uh, access or permissions. Uh, but occasionally we do have things that, you know, write a script or uh, submit a PR for this change, that kind of stuff. Um, and I think that part of the process is pretty well known, but then we get into where I think we really fall down, which is there's kind of a gap there between you're an apprentice and you're fixing things and you're submitting PRs. And then at some nebulous point, somebody says, oh, you've been doing a lot of stuff. Let's add you to some more groups and let you have more access to fix more things and you can work on this and this and this, that gap there is, is often where we run into problems because new people come in, they contribute, they do a PR or two, and then uh, they just sort of wander off because there's nothing else for them to do or we haven't like told them uh, where to go. Um, also, we've kind of avoided direct mentoring, like one-on-one, -on -one you know, you are assigned to this mentor, you should talk to this mentor because uh, we just don't have that many people. We have relatively few people working on things. And if we had say an influx of 10 people, you know, how do you decide who gets a mentor or not? Or do you just assign all 10 of those people to one mentor and then 
that mentor is completely, you know, overwhelmed. Um, so that's kind of the process, how it is now. And I, I've already pointed out some problems, but maybe there's a better way to do this. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a, a clever way we can do this. Uh, one of the ideas that was thrown out a while back was um, to try and do some more video type stuff like training, have a training process, you know, where we actually, a new person comes in and we say, hey, can you go through these training, you know, this training sequence and learn how to do a PR, how to do this, how to do that. Um, but, you know, again, that requires somebody to make those things and keep them up to date uh, and so forth. So that's kind of where things are now. I will shut up now and hopefully other folks will dive in. We can add people to the video chat if you want to uh, to uh, talk at length or uh, just add stuff to the chat. So. Um, do we want to address the questions people asked there while you were talking? Um, <laughs> sure. Because it's directly related to what you were saying. So. Um, the first one from Bookware, uh, does adoption of OpenShift changes the onboarding practices? Can it help uh, more info as code approach slash log slash metrics? Um, so that's about four questions in one, really. Um, that's me, actually. <laughs> oh, all right. I didn't realize. Sorry. Um, yeah. So does OpenShift change the onboarding practices? Not really. Small bit, I suppose. Um, you can get access depending as as Kevin said mentioned, like it is, it's very uh, up in the air. We don't have strict defined when someone should get access or when they're not, or a list of challenges they need to meet before they get it. But um with OpenShift, it's it's all run through Ansible. So you can raise PRs to create what you need to. They'll be reviewed by people who do have access and they'll be able to run it. Um, which kind of links to something Kevin said about the, gen the direct mentoring. Uh, although we don't assign mentors to people, if you have a specific problem and you might need help, you can reach out to one of us and we'll try to help you if we can. Um, it's not quite a mentorship level, but it's it's one on one helping per problem. It's a that's easier to manage because I mean it's only a set amount of our time. And we know exactly what we're going to be doing. So that can be a thing to do. With OpenShift, you can ask someone who does have access to help you to roll it out um, give you access to the namespace in the project. It's a more fine grained level of access, so it's probably a bit easier to get. Um, so as more infra as code approach, we, we generally use Ansible for everything anyway. So infra as code approach is kind of well indoctrinated into the team. Um, easier to access logs and metrics. Uh, the FI Apprentice gives you access to the log servers. As for metrics, Nagios is open read only to anyone, although that doesn't really give you full metrics. Um, metrics is probably something we're not great at, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your questions, if you have any more based off of that, or if anyone else wants to jump in with something I've missed. Well, the OpenShift metrics are actually pretty interesting from time to time, and we don't look at those very often. Um, but I don't know what the access is on those, if they're available or not. I'll have to check that. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, yeah, uh, Neil, we talked about uh, Prometheus uh, for some of our apps uh, a while back. So uh, I... A lot of them I would like to just get into OpenShift because it's kind of easier to deal with at that point. But yeah, cool. Yeah, I know. Anyone else David, want to David did look at on? Prometheus a little bit, but he's not here. So I even found out that we have in Fedora Infra uh, some repository that is that has the Flask Prometheus integration. Um, I wasn't aware that we have anything like this, so probably this could be a good to actually document somewhere for apps. <laughs> yeah. So, so the metrics and statistics in this sense, we're talking about asking new folks to look at that and try and uh, 
you know, come up with improvements or notice patterns or something like that? Yeah, I, I was uh, I was writing this question when you were talking about the SSH access that you give it to people so they can uh, actually go go and see themselves what's going on, and I was thinking if uh, like different ways of deployment uh, like re reduce the need to give people SSH access and do it in a more ex way like through web UI you can go and search through the logs already without SSH on the on the actual server. Right. Yep. Maybe we'll switch to the, the other notes I, I, I added here. Uh, so uh, I was wondering um, uh, for the titles of this work. So I often meet people who like sit on the ch channel and say, how do I become a DevOps person? And they look, where can I get a course on DevOps work? And I'm like, I actually know where you can get a hand-on experience, but they are not looking for only just a hand-on experience. They also want that title, which would they would use as a reference in in their mm. like CV and stuff like that. So I was thinking maybe uh, like adding these titles, which people are looking for as a, as a job uh, skill, uh, which they can sell when they go into a job interview. Maybe it will also increase the adoption of that, uh, uh, like an interest in the ad onboarding to this infrastructure work. Hmm. That's an interesting idea, and actually having those titles might be helpful to you know show progress for somebody between being an apprentice and being a you know like full access type of person. So yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, I, I regularly meet people who actually want to pay for someone to give them that certificate that we are DevOps people, you know, <laughs> that they, they can use for, for work. So if we can provide something like this for free, but like in exchange for, for that work, maybe it, it will uh, lead to more engaging uh, experience, yeah, for this. So, uh, you mentioned the gap, and you, in the sense of Kevin, the the gap uh, between people being apprentices and people being full members, and it sounds like uh, the um, the solution is to allow people to assume advanced roles, even though it's not possible to verify that they are uh, fully ready and that they will uh, not do anything bad. I mean. Uh, in my experience, people uh, are motivated to do things well, and they will um, do will not do harmful things uh, as long as they know what is outside of the scope which is allowed for them. So, uh, I think that like a soft uh, agreement that okay, you you in principle you can touch almost everything, but you will work on maybe on this service, and this is this for now. This is your part. This should be enough. Uh, Looking from the outside, um, even though I'm part of Fedora, but I'm not, not part of, of, of release engineering at all, uh, it is very hard to, to get insight into what is happening inside of release engineering and to get access. I mean, people have been asking for access for years and uh, for, to some parts, uh, and it took like, I don't know, ages. And I think that this is, I mean, this could be just, uh, fixed by assuming that people will do the right thing and giving them access when they ask for it. Yeah, some of that is historical, I think, because at least in infrastructure, the way the permission system was de designed is that there's a group for each app. So like if you're working on app X, you would be given sysadmin X to work with that particular application. So at, like things were kept very separated by application. But now, you know, things are in open shift and things are, are much more consolidated and we don't really have people who only work on, or we don't have very many people who only work on one specific application. Lots, most people work on, you know, lots of stuff. So, yeah. So we're coming to the end of this 15 minute block. If anybody wants to add anything else there or 
we have one question. Have a final message. Go ahead. We have one question in in the question and answer block. How can community people help make Relange Infra's job easier without being part of the team? That is a question I was hoping someone would ask, but was also fearing someone would ask. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's kind of the, the golden question, really, that it definitely doesn't have a perfect answer. Um, one thing we definitely always need is help with documentation. Uh, even if it's a case of joining someone while they're doing something and helping them document after, because as you know, when you're doing a task yourself and you write down, you leave out things that are assumed in your head, but might not necessarily be assumed with someone else. So that's one kind of easy bite to take. Um, another is to just try and learn. If you see a ticket that's of interest, even if you don't think you'd be able to do it, ask questions about it. Um, Someone's going to have to do it, so it's better if you ask questions. We can answer those questions. Maybe over time, you'll gain knowledge slash access to be able to do it yourself. Um, but like we want to share knowledge where we can. Um, it's just sometimes we don't know what to talk about. You'll often see every week we do it, or every second week we do a talk on our weekly meeting, but we don't know what topics to discuss. So that's another way you can tell us what you want to know. Um, and we'd be happy to share if we can. Uh, if anyone else wants to jump in there or if that answers your question, I don't know. But... All right, we're uh, we're at the 15 minute mark. Shall we jump to the next uh, topic? Yeah, the next what? most wanted is five year plans. Cool. Um, so I won't pontificate too much because I, like I said, I wanted to really hear other people's thoughts about this, but uh, we're generally very react reactive. Like somebody comes to us and says, we want to do this. Can you help us? Or, um, you know, uh, we react to problems that occur or, or whatnot. Um, and it would be very in our benefit to be more reactive or more proactive. Um, and it's really hard to predict. I mean, you don't know what the future is going to be like. In five years, things could be very different from the way they are today. Uh, I think there's going to be some general trends that are going to continue, uh, like moving stuff to cloud, uh, OpenShift, uh, automating, uh, GitOps. All these things are going to, going to be coming along. Um, but are there other things that we can do to prepare for that future? Are we, uh, can we come up with things that we should be thinking about now or working on now that will help us in a year or two years or three years? And it, again, it's really, really hard to say what those things might be. It's, it's, you know, crystal ball predicting the future type of thing. But like I said, there are trends and there are things that we can think about. Um, there are things that we got in early on, and it was greatly to our benefit, like uh, Fedora Infrastructure was, was one of the first big uh, folks using Puppet, and then one of the first folks using Ansible. And, uh, you know, we, we really uh, kind of pioneered a lot of stuff in that area because we were there ready to go. Um, so I'll shut up now and let other folks dive in, but... Uh, I'd really like to hear uh, where you think we'll be in five years, what we should work on now that will help us in the future, that kind of thing. So I, I jumped in, Kevin, because I think this one caught my attention pretty significantly. Um, what do you think about uh, writing documents, like having having effectively a series of things that are that look like press releases? Um, to identify what we think it should look like in the future. You know, like Fedora infrastructure, you know, moves X whatever workload to, you know, whatever location. And then um, have that as yeah, that, sort of a guiding light. That might be that yeah. might be interesting. I know that, that some folks have in our work upper organization have started doing a three-year plan where they try and like kind of predict the the future and and uh, lay out some stuff and that could be a mechanism for doing that yeah 
I think the yeah. I, so the reason I think that's that's a, an an interesting idea is that trying to write a five year design document is like an outrageous task, right? Like, but but trying to write, you know, but writing something that is a vision document, I think that's that's you know, and trying to keep it very short, um, and then leveraging, you know, like a, a frequently asked questions kind of response model gives you something that you can granularly modify over the five years that it's supposed to be in, you know, in, in action. So, I, you know, that's something that I think, I think goes a long way um, in, in terms of, of creating a, a vision plan that people who are apprentices can, can get behind and then have kind of a, you know, a business practice that they know is going to drive whatever it is that they do in terms of their design and, and initiatives. Uh, I like the sound of that. One thing I would say is five years is a very long time in tech. It is. It yeah. is. But it, yeah, it's something that we, I really feel like it's something we can do in terms of vision, but it's, I don't think that you could storyboard five years of activity. Right. I mean, just that be outrageous. So I think keeping it short and identifying it as being like a, a really nice to have goal, you know, to keep us co uh, keep a cohesive vision is great. But then there'll be lots and lots of smaller change proposals that we we'd expect to just be part of the same, you know, like fit into one of those questions, the frequently asked questions kind of style. All right. I have to say stuff now. All right. This is, I don't know. I, I was wondering if Neil could resist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, uh, this is going to hurt a little, but I think thinking about a five-year plan is probably a bad idea. Um, observing how we've you know, done even two- or three-year plans or even five-year plans within the wider Fedora context, uh, that hasn't worked very well, um, mostly because we as a community can really only conceptualize like all the planning that we managed to do within maybe six months is already hard enough as it is going out to a year already gets slightly fuzzy when we get to two years or further like those plans tend to like not survive first contact with anything but yeah like like we are saying in the chat a five-year goal might make more sense rather than strictly going out and trying to do a plan because uh we're all going to just wind up with a whole heap of disappointment if we do a five-year plan. But like, maybe we could think about um, a structure of things that we want to we want to try to accomplish within the next year, and then have a long-term, mid-term, and long-term goal, like a three-year goal and a five-year goal. But like, maybe more more planning for like one year, and and kind of go from there. Because I think the further out you go, the harder it is to actually stick to it. Things just change too much for that to, to be reasonably workable. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's pretty similar to what David was saying. It's There's no point in setting something down and stolen that you want in five years yeah, he, because realistically it'll never happen. Sorry, Alexander. Go ahead. I guess I was I mean with the same thing Leonardo said so uh, we shouldn't be setting five years as a goal uh, to achieve all the stuff we're it's, it's more like a scale uh, of, of the things which we're talking about but we can set like a couple of goals of five year size and then move in that direction and it doesn't mean that we promise we will be delivering that in five years it doesn't mean we actually have direct plan to it but it's a direction of um, like the scope of the work which we want to achieve and we can move in that direction as, as, as fast as we can right yeah like documentation over wiki you know is a is something that you can set out as a as a five-year plan like that migration strategy would be somewhere you'd go but it's not but it's not necessarily telling you exactly how you're going to do it or what wiki you're going to use. You know, I'm sorry, what, you know, what documentation model you're going to use. All those things have to happen in very, very granular changes. That's that's a good example. But can you guys think of any other ones? Because I'm thinking of lots of things 
that we want to do that are reactive again, like we should move everything that's rel seven or eight to rel nine, but that's reactive to rel nine being out. So is there I don't know if I would consider that reactive. Things? So, so we could generalize this to be a much more proactive thing. So instead of specifying that we're talking about rel nine, let's say the more proactive thing is let's make it, let, let's aim for making it possible for us to redeploy our infrastructure on the newest uh, targeted platform um, on a regular basis. Like, yeah, like every, we already do this with Koji said, itself. Yeah. We already do, do it on a rolling Koji basis. Itself. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I, Latency I'm, sucks. I'm sorry too, Neil. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. But, but uh, I think that that's, that's, kind of, that's a super exciting idea. But just to say, you know, instead of saying some one version, just say, okay, we'll be able to roll to latest every six months, right? Or every, you know, and that's our goal. Every year. That doesn't necessarily, yeah, that's right. And yeah. it certainly doesn't, for it to be a five-year goal, certainly doesn't have to be something we think we can achieve today. Yeah. Like, and and I consider, if we generalize that idea, like that makes it more proactive because we're, we're talking more about making the mechanics of doing those upgrades easier and more regular and straightforward as opposed to like let's say we got a deadline this we got to kill off this rel 7 box or god forbid this rel 6 box that's still floating around screwing up our souls uh and and making it so that we think about all right with our infrastructure that we have today you know how do we actually get this running how do we get this deployed how do we redeploy this how do we advance it how do we all these other things thinking about it from that perspective changes a reactive th um action to a proactive one uh at least in my view well, that's how gives, my team at dado has thought about things yeah and it gives everyone a schedule and it makes it makes the you know makes the the process more blame you know the thing to blame rather than any people you know and and that way you know we can we can just look at it and say okay so we're rolling in six months everybody's working towards that goal where you know we we have uh you know, like we have a security exception. A security exception looks like this. And, you know, over these five years, this is, you know, our goal is to make that, you know, our ability to manage a zero day exploit of some sort, you know, within such and such an SLA. And then that way we're not, we're not spending our time trying to tell everybody what tool they're going to use. Although, I mean, I do also think that there are, you know, 12 factor app kind of goals that we would have too, right? So I know that's, a, you know, anyway. But, you so know, just they, a few more minutes left. On I, want, minute, so. I want to ask a question. If you consider like, like more infrastructure focus or more Fedora release engineering focus, because there were like two directions of, of development here. One is uh, developing in terms of, of generic infrastructure, continuous, uh, everything. And the other plans which we can consider is like, are we going to still build Fedora the way we build it uh, in five years? What are the changes, how, how we want to maybe change the Fedora Compose to stop being a Compose, which is honestly the goal I would love to, <laughs> to have. And uh, does it fit into this uh, area or do you see it like a, some different team needs to work on that? So, yeah, I think this, I was more thinking of the infrastructure side. Release engineering, I think, has to work with the other parts of the project to decide those things, right? I mean, release engineering is the one who has to implement them, but, you know, like, the council and Devel list and Fesco and all those folks need to say, here's what we, we want to do. So I, I think that's a, a group goal, maybe, or a group task. But, but Relinge about... falls into the to the same trap of being reactive, you know, like here's another deliverable. We'll deliver it just the same way we deliver everything else and etc. Yeah, this is where I have a feeling that oh like if we wait for Fedora Console to decide such things, this will never happen because Fedora Console doesn't have expertise on that level and it doesn't also have understanding of what's possible and, and 
I think console in this sense also sits and waits in more re reactive state because it says, uh, waits for feedback from actual engineers, which would come with requests, what we need uh, from Fedora project and Fedora build process. So I think we were lucky in the leadership in this case and Relang team can actually be that leadership. It doesn't mean they can do it alone. It's of course, it's like a cross distribution effort, but this thought leadership in this area, I feel like it's missing completely. I, I think you're right. And I think one of the reasons for that is that right now, uh, paid to be on release engineering is Tomash. And that's it. <laughs> I'm not, I actually do release engineering in my spare time. And so, you know, there's, there's a kind of a lack of manpower there, I think, but uh, I think this is something, if you wanted to change that, it would be, you know, interested parties getting together and putting together a proposal for it, essentially, and, and driving that forward. Okay, so the next topic we have is uh, how to handle Fedora Infra Tech Debt, and same amount of volts is ways to improve communication. So, I'm I not consider sure. communication more important than than the deck. Oh, okay. I will write the notes because Mark is the one who actually added it. Uh, also, just to note, at the top of the hour, we're going to take a little break uh, and let everybody go get coffee and walk around for a few. So that would be good. Yep. <laughs> good. Yep. Um. Yeah. So. With this one, it's a case of we have multiple ways to talk to people. Um, it's not always clear. Like if we announce an outage or something, the current way is we raise an issue on the tracker and we mail the mailing list. But to be honest, we've no feedback as to who's seen this. Um, oh, and we use our status, which should be where people check, hopefully. Um, but we, yeah, we don't get much feedback as to who's seen this. Um, other things, if we want to ask a question, we don't know whether we're not reaching the right people or whether people don't feel engaged. Uh, it's hard to really know. Um, discourse is something as a team we don't really use much. Maybe we should start. Uh, it's kind of just wanting to know where people are and where they want to talk. Um, Matrix, IRC, mailing list discourse. What should we use? Should we use all of them? Should we only use one of them? Um, as the more you have, the harder it is to track. So my preference can be towards using one to two of them for main communication, but which ones that should be, I don't know. Uh, it's kind of an open question for people here. And a tough one to answer. So, I mean, at least for me, I look. I, I see the the mailing list posts, and I see the um, I see the the ticket items. But that's because I'm subscribed to the Relinch ticket tracker. Um, I think most people are not subscribed to the ticket tracker. Um, the mailing list post is is useful. Uh, there was something I suggested uh, in another session earlier that uh, you know for the change announcements that. You know, people say like non-technical people who are largely on discussion rather than on the mailing lists. Like maybe we should have those mirrored into discussion as non-repliable um, topics. Like they're basically locked topics that auto that are auto mirrored from the um, devil announce or I, I, do we have a rel engine announce? I, I don't know. Um, but whatever announce email list we have, maybe they should be configured to mirror into discourse without letting people reply so that they can see that those are happening as announcements. Um, for um, real-time chat, I personally rely entirely on matrix now. Um, going back to IRC is painful and sucky. Um, so I like using matrix for that sort of thing. And I don't know how the rest of the community has been doing it, but I, I've seen a fair bit of adoption, at least in the Matrix rooms that I'm in, where there's a lot of people that are coming in from Matrix rather than from the IRC bridge. And the proportion of signal to noise uh, for IRC people has gone way down. Um, and it's more spam than not from the IRC side. Uh, 
that sort of thing. I don't know if that jives with other people's experiences, but that's that's pretty much what I've been seeing. I've actually been seeing the very most spam from Telegram bridges, the second most spam from Matrix, and a few from IRC. But the room time and don't have Telegram bridges, so that's probably why I don't see those. Yeah, that's te Telegram is horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> we should just all move to Slack. Uh, don't, oh, say <laughs> no, don't say don't that. Don't say that. No. Uh, yeah. right. That's hard that to get that reaction. All right. <laughs> oh, yeah. One thing yeah. I left off, which I just remembered, was um, blogs. They're also something we use for communications for what we're doing. I don't know if people read those or not. Um, funnily enough, I, uh, I think Neil, no offense, but you're probably the worst person to answer this question because you already seem to be kind of everywhere anyway. <laughs> I was hoping to get some larger reach in the community of people who wouldn't be as active to see because one of the things I feel with this is there's a lot of people who see everything, the core group that are always around, and if we could reach them more, that would be better. Yeah, if there's uh, folks in the chat who have opinions on this, where do you see Infra and Relinge stuff, or do you? Uh, and where would you look if you were looking for it? So I've got a bigger opinion on this one too, I guess, than I thought I did. Um, I like the idea of having uh, just generally a fairly large um scope on the reporting so like having having the blog post is something that is the the foundation and then extracting the information into the other locations seems to me like a much better way of handling that because then you can have like specific messaging that you think covers the impacted you know impacted groups and what you want them to do and you have a location for them to stay tuned and a place to update with the with the information and then you can sort of centrally link anything that would be leveraged for the communication right like bugzilla or you know whatever whatever uh look you know the issue for the, you know the Pagura issue or whatever can just be kind of linked back to that that central location where you have all of the content that you might want to be associated with the with the outage or issue. And then one more thing, just generally being able to collect all of that content, you know, in a JSON format would make life hugely easy to to give everybody exactly what they want. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll just throw in here <clears throat> a quick thought about um, discourse versus uh, mailing lists. Um, I'm an adaptable person. I can use whatever. But the thing that I I think that bothers me about discourse is that it's uh, it's a poll model, so you have to remember to go to the site and, and read it. And it's presented in the way that that site presents it to you. Whereas email is a, a, poll, mo or a, a poll model where you have automated processes that deal with it. And all of your sites, all of your mailing lists, all of your stuff comes through your filtering. Uh, and it's presented locally the way you want to present it, Mutt or Thunderbird or Evolution or whatever you want to, however you want to see it. And somebody made a very good point in the, an LWN conversation about this. All the old timers, all of the folks who have been in open source for many years have a elaborate system of email filters and displaying, you know, where things are filtered to and you know when to, to go through your mail and so forth. And people who are new to open source don't have that. They don't have that set up and they are much more comfortable with a place where they can go and just read it and it keeps track of things. They don't see, need to set up these elaborate filters and everything. So it's a real dichotomy for the older people. Email is a lot better 
for the newer people, this course is a lot better. So it's difficult to bridge that gap. I don't know how we do, but I mean, just an we, opinion. Yeah, we, so I find with filters, that. I've been setting them up and changing them constantly, but it just leads to missed mail. Well, I mean, yeah, that's one of, one of the of reasons filters. I don't. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I don't use filters very much. Yeah, tremendously differently. I mean, I. I, I relied on email filters when email was text, but I spend a lot of time now reading HTML-based email, and it is not as easy to filter. Yeah, And I'm uh, using the zero inbox rule, so I just have tons of filters, actually, so... <laughs> And plenty of folders to actually use. So I think that the, this is like a secondary issue because uh, nowadays everything is bridged to everything else and it's kind of easy to forward stuff. The question is what, what you want to actually display to people. And uh, I think that uh, a human needs to write text uh, in a way that is accessible to people. And this is the big problem. Um, and once you have it, I mean, you can fling it to any channel you want. And I, uh, I, I feel that communication is missing at this level, that we need somebody who can actually filter from what, what happened during the last week or the last month and present it in a way that is uh, legible to, to people who are not intimately involved. Uh, this is something that, 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 that needs to be done. That's yeah, and that's that takes a lot of time and effort. Um, the a complete example of that, or the perfect example of that, I'm thinking of is Mo Duffy's uh, summaries when they were redesigning the websites. She would do these blog posts that had like mock-ups explaining the thought process, how everything went. And they were huge and long, but they were really, really well done, and they were really engaging. And you know, everybody read them. And, I'm sure that took her tons, tons of time to put those together, um, but it, it helped a lot. People really understood the process a lot better. Well, but I mean, even at a lower level, I mean, just, okay, this, this is like a very f extreme case, but a few paragraphs or two paragraphs of text, uh, I mean, it's not, shouldn't take that much to write. It's, it's most, I mean, I think that the problem is that this needs to be done, done by, by somebody who is uh, involved in many things, uh, in enough things to, to understand what's going on and have an overview. It, it's hard to do from the outside and it's hard to do like for, for an intern, I think. So one of the things that I was thinking is that whatever location it is, it should kind of represent a collection of those of that kind of uh, separation of duties, right? So one, there's a there's a group of people who are working currently, and they're going through a thought process and moving through things. Two, there's a status, right? There's there's simply this is where we are and where we're trying to get, right? And then after that, there's a, a review of you know, there's kind of a review of that correction, right, that, that goes through. So you do the post-mortem and being able to have all of those in a single location seems to me, you know, with like one basic identifier seems like a huge, uh, would be a huge benefit. And then however you want to syndicate it, right, that is up to everybody else's tool, right? That's how the new hotness works. Somebody here, you know, puts a lot of time and effort into. <laughs> yeah, the new hotness is actually something I'm working on. <laughs> but yeah, I'm not the one who actually wrote it. And uh, about the summaries, we are sending every week the CP weekly summary which is the work that the CP did. Part of it is in a friend range. And we are doing each quarter, the quarterly reports. So we are trying to share this as well. 
these are only shared on the on the community blog but uh, we are doing it each quarter all right so that's uh, the end of this uh, time block if anyone wants to throw any final thoughts in on this um, and now we have scheduled to take a quick break so why don't we stop here and everybody go get coffee and walk around and I'll go feed cats before they uh, attack me and uh, we'll be back here. Did I say 10 after or 15 after, but you can get back before that and, and uh, chit chat and add Q and a stuff for the Q and a talk, etc. All right, shall we uh, get back into it? What's our next topic? Okay, your next topic or most voted topic was how to handle Fedora Infra Tech Debt, which will be on me. So I can take notes. Okay. Okay, so just make it a bit little bigger. Okay, so currently we have a lot of tech devs in in front launch team. Uh, we are trying to uh, address this, but uh, there is most of it is still growing, and more time we actually don't work on it. It's growing much more. I tried to create a list of it and that i'm sharing right now and i want to discuss here how do you think is the best way to approach this uh, as in front range or do you think there is something that we missed in uh, in the tech depth as well so i will just uh, uh recapitulate what is on the list can, can you we post the link that link in the chat uh i don't is think this invisible? is visible okay uh, it's not visible because uh i don't think this is actually uh reachable by anyone in the outside red hat let me think look at if i can share the link outside but i don't think it's it's possible to actually do it yeah, I can just do general access to Red Hat only, the internal Red Hat, so... Uh. Or maybe we could export it to another one or something, just so folks can look at it. Yeah, okay. I can actually... Um, or save it a copy check. or something. Okay, I'm just not sure where to... Uh, I can create a copy, but uh, I don't have any other Google account than the Red Hat one. <laughs> and everything I create there is actually restricted. Actually, if you want to keep talking, I'll see if... Yeah, and and if you want to keep talking about do... it, I'll see if I can share it. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think if you go okay. to share and copy link, there's another option there to be able to do it. Yeah, I don't think there is anything uh, actually on the on the document that don't that can that isn't actually visible to public. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, okay. So let me just recapitulate uh, the list right now. And um, so we have here the, we have some apps that are still in Python 2. Uh, those I, the maps I only listing here is are the apps that are actually uh, are actually just critical. We are considering to critical. I didn't look at the authors that we actually have. Only the those that we actually man, maintain. And not only the critical ones, but yeah, those that we maintain as a CP team, not as in front range itself. So there are still 
some apps we have a Python too. Some of it has uh, how to say it. There, uh, we don't know what uh, we should do with them because we don't really want to keep them. They are just more maintenance for us. But uh, this is why we and we don't have spare cycles to actually port them to something newer. Um, the apps we have here, uh, I have the link here, but uh, there are only three apps right now, which is not that bad, but still. Uh, next thing is the federal messaging. Uh, the most blocking apps here are the FMN and the badges, which are really uh, tied up to the Fed message and uh, they are using till all the messages uh, that they are consuming will have uh, federal messaging message schemas. It will be hard for us to actually uh, do uh, actually at the get rid of the Fed message and skip everything to federal messaging. Right now, uh, we have at least bridge that is uh, converting the federal messaging to Fed message. So those apps could still can consume them, but it would be nice to actually just have everything in federal messaging. Uh, next thing is the missing documentation. We have plenty of things that are not documented as, uh, at all. We have apps that were just created and nobody actually created documentation for them. So yeah, and this is uh, actually adding up each time the, somebody is changing something into the, in the app. Outdated documentation is another one that is just uh, just continuation of the missing documentation. But we have the documentation, but it's out of date. And uh, no, we usually lack somebody with the knowledge about the apps. So it's hard to actually uh, update it. A missing unit test. We have plenty of apps that don't have unit test. And it would be nice to actually have everything tested is better for uh, any other any new contributor to actually test out the app. Next one is the OIDC support. Not every app has it. We don't have much apps, I think, that uh, still miss it. We have a ticket for it, but yeah, there are some. Next thing is uh, services running on outdated systems, which are another thing this is usually because of another tech debt that is actually blocking us to move it to something newer uh, next thing is large amount of trackers we have rent right now uh, around 130 trackers we should watch as a team which is not really great and uh, we, we don't have that much people to actually watch everything that is going on. We are trying to at least address that those that are most pressing. But yeah, we don't have maintainer for every app we actually uh, own in uh, in the infra. Uh, not about automation. We still have uh, things that we need to automate, but we don't uh, have uh, an automation. We are trying to do the to uh, address this and. Uh, automate things, but not everything is automated yet. Unification of tools. We have plenty of apps with variable tools. We don't have any unified set of tools that we can actually, uh, everybody who wants any app for infra actually write. We don't have any unification of this. Uh, monitoring of services. Um, I think we don't ha have that bad good monitoring that we should have, but we still at least have some. Map of services, this was actually uh, partially addressed by creating map of critical services. Uh, next one is disaster and recovery plan. Uh, I don't think we even have one. And the last one I have here is the major upgrades of your dependencies. Uh, something that should be actually handled by uh, automatically and we should just watch if this didn't break anything and don't have apps with outdated dependencies. OK. And this is all I have on the list. I'm not sure if anybody actually have any 
any luck with uh, with sharing the document at least the uh, uh, copying of the list would be nice yeah I, and I kind of at a high level i wrote the list in the hacking g document too if folks want to look over that okay yeah i will probably share it instead of this document it will be better okay let me so, just switch it so from my viewpoint there's no magic bullet here i think we just need to maybe dedicate a certain amount of time always to working on the tech debt so you know like each quarter we pick something or figure out something and try and work on that i don't see that there's any kind of magic solution uh, to this problem everybody has tech again, debt. It's just the way it is as i see that you actually added to the wrong uh topic <laughs> Oops, I'll move it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think there is a silver bullet. I just want to start the discussion what people think we should do, how we should address this, how we should actually look uh, into it. And if we actually missed anything that the uh, infrared range should uh, actually consider as tech debt in this case. Okay, I will just. Oh yeah, uh, the list of packages we are responsible for maintaining. We have, I think, Bugzilla for for this. Uh, at least I have some something. <laughs> Let me just. Look at look for the link. Uh, Oops, sorry about that. Hey, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, here it is. So I push, um, it's an ODS file, you'll have to download it yourself, but that's uh. Oh, sorry, I put it into the wrong section as well, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. That's the Excel file in here, or the sheets, I don't know what to call it. Okay. Okay, so, yeah, the Packages are something that we we have as well. We have some packages that we maintain. Uh, not all of them are actually in uh, this kit. I think the planet is just something that we just uh, we uh, do inside the uh, inf infra infra uh, in Koji, and it's not really in in this kit. Which is something that is not not really great. So uh, <clears throat> to address something that David is saying there in uh, chat, uh, I think we tried to do a situation where we had somebody who was a primary contact for each application to kind of watch that application, but we didn't get a whole lot of takers <laughs> on some of the applications. So I'm not sure if that really worked or if we just didn't do it. Right. So we're actually coming to the uh, end of this block. If uh, folks have any further uh, thing to add here, if anybody wants to jump in uh, from the chat, we can add you to uh, the video as well. I think that says we have enough tech debt to where it takes us 15 minutes to talk about what we have <laughs> before <laughs> we even get to solutions. Yeah. If anyone in the community wants to take on anything, please do. <laughs> We're more than happy to give pointers and help out where we can.
That's a very good question, Leo. Um, so we have, uh, sorry, we're just about to run out of time. Um, we do have a GitHub, uh, is a group they're calling GitHub, so I forget what they're called, called Fedora Infra, that has a lot of our apps under it. So if you go to the GitHub, dot com forward slash Fedora Infra, you can see the apps that are there. There's issues in all of them. So can, contribution can go there. And also in Pigura, we have the same the Fedora Infra group. Um, you'll see our repos there, a lot of them have issues in them. Um, feel free to start contributing. If you're lacking access or something, reach out on IRC. Someone will be able to get it for you. As far as Python 3, uh, the big things left are FMN, which is being worked on now, PDC, which we want to get rid of completely, uh, and badges. And we are actually looking for folks to work on badges. So, uh, yeah, if that, that would be yeah. an excellent one to work on. We are looking to maintain our four badges right now. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, what's our next uh, topic? Okay, let me check. Um, okay, so this was done. This was done. I see that this one has three votes and and there are question and answers. So yeah, this is the last one we have here before the questions and answers, and it's mine as well. Um, okay, so in this case, we it was three years ago decided that we will get rid of some of the services we own. Uh, the, the reason for this was to focus on the services that are critical to Fedora and not really take care of services that are just nice to have. Uh, we had a blog post when we tried to actually explain everything, why we are doing this, what are the uh, applications that we uh, want to get rid of, what uh, are the apps that we want to still own. Uh, the issue is here that uh, the, these apps are still used by community. In some cases, they don't have any maintainer. And because we were the last one who actually touched them, we get the issues for them and sometimes people just complaining about them and we uh, we are not sure who actually how we should approach this if we should uh, just ignore these issues so we have time to focus on something that is more important for the front range we know that this makes people people angry especially those that actually like those apps, but uh, we are not sure how how approach this because it's some things that is hard to hard to take on, and uh, we don't really want the people to uh, be angry on the infernal range because we didn't uh, take care of app that we owned a long time ago and that is still that is in some kind of uh, just support mode that if there is or fix the worst issue mode and uh, some of the apps we just restarting and not have time to actually uh, have, work on them and we in some cases even lack the knowledge because the people who wrote it are not part of the team anymore okay so yeah i'm waiting for any response <laughs> Uh, I think actually one thing that we could do better is maybe set some expectations. So like for those apps, we could, um, well, depending on where they are located, have something in the top level readme or the issues template or something that says, hey, this app is not a priority. Um, it's currently looking for people to help work and maintenance on it please contact us if you want to help, blah, 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 that kind of thing, rather than have them just file a ticket or an issue and then nothing ever happens. I don't know. Just that's the only thought that we aren't doing that I could come up with. 
Yeah, I think uh, maybe updating just to read me of the apps would be be enough. Yeah, so think... Alexandra asks if we should adopt a uh, review process for packages and an orphaning process for uh, use that for applications. We could try and do that, but I think there's some application like badges is a good example. You know, it's alerting and it has problems and it needs to be ported to Python 3 and we don't have cycles. If we just dropped it, I think people would be very, very upset. <laughs> Even yep. if we, just, we announced that it was not working right. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if that's a good solution. Um, yeah, we're kind of stuck that we want we want less apps to maintain, but pretty much everyone there has merit. So it's very hard to choose what to get rid of if we can get rid of any. And when you spread yourself thinner, your level of maintenance on the ones that exist naturally gets a bit less. It's harder to keep to a higher standard. So for Existing applications, it's harder because we were created in the situation where there are no rules and and, and uh, people have different expectations for that. But I, I'm, I was thinking that for new applications, if you set these policies in action, first of all, be, because you link them with already uh, existing policies of a project, you will uh, get less people angry at you as the team which like deploys them, but it's just like a adopted policies in a project and everyone knows why they are there. So you can kind of jump on, on, on top of that and then uh, use the same terminology and then say same concept. Uh, and, and then uh, for new applications, it would be easier that people will agree in advance to this process. They will not be surprised that it's happened. it happens this way. So they will uh, realize that they need to like build a, a process to create new maintainers for their apps in long term. So this is also part of their task and not just the, the code itself. For all the prep, prep uh, applications uh, and badges, I I, I see <laughs> I see a bigger problem here. But uh, I guess uh, yeah, call to actions maybe may may help more. Repeated, but I, I know I know you did it already. But it's like doing a regular call to action maybe. Uh, that's can help. Yeah. Uh, in case of badges, we tried to do it multiple times, but. Uh, we didn't really get a maintainer that uh, will maintain it in long time. So, yeah. Uh, I think the other apps that we actually don't maintain, but it's still getting back, is the nuance here. That doesn't have any maintainer right now, and uh, it's still used by, by folks. But, yeah, we don't have anybody maintaining it, and uh, it's just... So, every time... We actually, uh, every time anything happens with the app, we get the ticket because there isn't nobody else who actually work on it. I think another thing that could help here is um, moving more things to OpenShift. Because <laughs> if we have a, a framework for deploying and if we set that up, you know, here's the app, we deploy it with a, a you know, source to image, uh, build or something like that, and it's all there. And then if somebody wants to take over maintenance, they just need to take over the actual maintenance. They don't need to worry about the deployment and the, you know, the the details of that. They can just push their changes and have them just be there. So I think that would help a little bit, maybe lower the barrier to entry. I have read something that you are trying to create a common best practices policies for OpenShift. I think that would really help a lot because it will uh, really reduce. Yeah, you, you would be uh, able to separate knowledge of OpenShift from knowledge of the application and deployments from the, the code coding part. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And that's one thing where we're really bad right now. In, our infrastructure, we have a bunch of things deployed in OpenShift, but they're doing all kinds of different things. Some of them are building the image in, in Quay and 
you know, importing it down. Some of them are doing source to image. So they're building the image actually in our OpenShift. Some of them are, you know, uh, doing layered images. Some of them are doing all kinds of things. So yeah, a best practice is there is something definitely that we want to work on. So. I think uh, our team uh, internally faced the same problems and uh, we actually created a document which we call universal OECI deployment and we would use Helm charts and it will describe where secrets are going and things like that. And I think we did a talk about this at DEF CON last year, if I, if I find this. So uh, yeah, it, it's it's maybe raise the priority for this item because it's it's... Uh, for our team, it helped a lot. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I do think that kind of ties in with what Kevin was saying earlier. We need to set expectations and set hard expectations to say these are the ones that we're giving full attention to. These are the ones that we'll really try, but they're lower priority. And these are the ones that we'll get to and we get to. It's never going to be popular, whichever ones you pick, but we just kind of have to make the decision. We at least have some service level expectations to have written some time ago. And here they are. <laughs> yeah, and another thing we'd like to do, but again, uh, we, we don't really have the capacity is there's certain ones like PDC which could be split out into other apps and gotten rid of so there'll be one less to maintain but we uh, this goes back to the pro proactive versus reactive if we could be more proactive if we had the ability for it it might actually reduce what we need to maintain as well so I'm looking at the last node that the standard is a deployment I would say that this is part of the tech depth that for the unification of tools we are using. So we have similar uh, the release process, similar deployment process for your apps, at least the apps we own by yourself. Yeah. Yep, I see definitely the overlap there. All right, so just a few more minutes on this, if anyone has further thoughts before we move on. Again, on the like marketing part of this, should we? Uh, what are the, the options for a person if like we, we come and say, okay, I'm going to maintain this. What perks I get out of this? Can I uh, can I rename the project to my fancy name? Can I like do, do something? So what kind of I don't know gamification or whatever we can do out of out of this process. Funnily enough, badges is probably the answer there. The that we need <laughs> yeah, with a badge of badges, this this is a <laughs> thing we, we can do. If you if you step up and the maintain badges, you can get badges. Wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I also thinking maybe of uh, like sh should we. Uh, again, it, it also goes to back with to maintainer policies. So so you can say. Uh, you're becoming Fedora app maintainer now, and this is the role. This is the the title you can use some somewhere. Yeah. And if you are the maintainer, you can actually look at the app and uh, add any feature you want. So it's on you. You are the maintainer. From a professional standpoint, that's something you could put on your CD. I am the maintainer of this app. Could this great app and how many people use it and it looks good i see a question if there are cookie badges <laughs> i'm not sure if we have any <laughs> i think there is i think if you get a certain amount of cookies you get a badge for it yeah yep there's a whole series uh, i don't remember what the lower ones were but i know that the very top one is the stoop waffle <laughs> All right, that's about time for this one. Um, I don't know, I guess 
we just had Q and A, but it occurs to me that I actually left some time uh, for revisiting, also. So let's see. Yeah, like well, I guess we could do Q and A, or we could revisit some of these topics, or throw it to open floor, or do whatever we wish to do. Yeah, I will just uh, I will just leave you in in a few minutes because I have talk at uh, at the time. <laughs> ah, okay. I want to ask a question which I forgot to ask in the previous session is, uh, have you following uh, the Alma Linux build system or Peridot build system efforts? And what do you think about that and uh, in, in any related stuff? Uh, I haven't been following it, so I don't know anything about it. But I think if it's Alma... interesting, then we should take a look, yeah. So, so we we stopped uh, using Koji for builds, and uh, it, I, I was only checking the Alma version because I wasn't at CentOS Dojo, and we were doing uh, like pulp as an artifact storage, some Python scripts and glue, and like Celery and container based mock builds, and and uh, like um, this kind of orchestration. So, uh, I was wondering if something of that can be reused in, in the our infrastructure as well, but it's like n nothing specific yet. Yeah. yeah, at least in the release engineering side, there's a, you know, we keep using Koji and we keep bolting things onto it. And Koji is pretty darn old at this point. I mean, it served very long and well, but we keep talking about a Koji 2.0, but that never happens, so. Oh, the, the one conversation I had is that it is really hard to innovate in the area of build packages when you have active project with 20,000 of packages on them and yeah. uh, you are always like uh, in, working within these restrictions. But uh, this um, Fedora ELN effort, which we started re recently, so, so to say, um, the one of the reasons why we wanted it is like to, to be a separate build route and separate configuration, but also it can be like experimental playground because it has a reduced number of packages, it's like 2,000 instead of 20,000, and it, it it doesn't affect the main Fedora deliverables and can be a more flexible in, in approaches. So, uh, yeah, I was thinking that maybe we can like deploy a small version of a MVP of a prototype of a new super fancy build build system just for that specific build route, and then see if it if it we like it and we want to extend it. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, really, the only thing going on right now in the Koji space that I know of is um, the IoT folks are moving to uh, OS build, um, so the Koji OS build plugin stuff is now working, uh, so we'll see how uh, how that works out for them. I see in the chat there is a community shift pensions. Can you talk more about this? <laughs> or is, is it uh, the topic is live or what's the state of it? Uh, I guess maybe Mark would be best to answer that or? Sorry, can you just repeat it again? So someone else is asking me something that I'm not sure. Uh, uh, David was mentioning CommuniShift, or we should force David to join in and talk about it. <laughs> oh, so what, where are we at with CommuniShift, is it? Um, so it's started, we started like looking at it, doing some work, doing some implementation. Uh, I, to be honest, I don't know how much of this I'm supposed to say publicly. <laughs> Uh, but it is it's coming and um, I don't I don't know how long a uh, couple of months hopefully but coming back you should say. coming back yes well okay. I would say coming because this is community <laughs> shift 3.0 it's a new <laughs> so I hope um, it's for our four point something if yeah. we're talking about <laughs> <that much. laughs> uh, but yeah it's it's coming um I think the reason I'm kind of hesitant to talk about it is we haven't like um, clarified the rules around use and stuff yet, so I don't want to make any promises that I can't keep. 
but it will be there in, in some shape or form. And uh, that actually leads back to some of the discussions we just had because having that community shift, I think, will also help us onboard people, and I think it'll help us find uh, app owners too because we can they can use that as a development instance and have access to you know deploy the app new version that they want to do or whatever. So I'm really hoping we can get that rolled out yeah. soon. Uh it is like David Kerwin probably has a good idea in this. It will I'm gonna put my neck in the line here and say it'll be here before the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you can blame me if it's not, but I'll blame David, so it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, so David says the cluster is up. It's actually running in, in AWS. So just needs some work, and then it'll be ready. Yeah, I think there, there's possibly some clarification around um, legal issues related to GDPR as well that have to be decided. I'm not 100% sure where they are with that. It's kind of above my pay grade, but... As I heard, they might need to be sorted before we actually release it. <clears throat> Just because if, if we give free access to everyone, we need to make sure the data is okay. I guess that's the same story for, for Copper and, and for any service which we start to provide for the wide yeah. audience. We uh, forced to create certain rules or terms of services or something like that. Otherwise, uh, this is becoming, we're not in that fully open world where everyone yeah. trusts everyone any, anymore. We have to uh, oblige to certain levels. Yeah. Yeah, I see uh, Neil found the, uh, or posted the old uh, Koji 2.0 talk from 2016 flock. <laughs> ah, I saw it. Well. Um, so let's see, do we want to do some q and I, I guess we're just kind of... Uh, Open flooring it for the rest of the time. How much time do we have left? Uh, we're booked until minutes. 30 minutes, yeah, okay. I kind of wanted to go back to the five-year plan. <clears throat> yeah, Looks sure. like you did too. <laughs> <laughs> Because it seemed like there was some there was some question about like the scope, and I you know, uh, so Alexandra mentioned um, Relinge over over Infra um, in terms of the planning process, and I I was curious um, if maybe there was there was um, some way to separate them that felt very clear with respect to who was defining process. It's, do, do you suggest that we like separate uh, infra group from relange group and uh, set up as a different directions for them? Well, maybe, maybe that we don't even worry about it, that like just just set up the you know like create the tenants and the and and give it some body and then if something is determined to be rel -eng over infrastructure in in um, uh, in direction then we just cut it out and you know hand it over does that make sense like yeah, I think there shouldn't be any border on what happens in the five-year plan. <clears throat> it should, it should just sort of naturally 
lead to, to our argument over whether it's, you know, it's engineer, you know, it's release engineering or if it's infrastructure management. I kind of have the view there and obviously you could disagree or not, but uh, if we're setting the five-year goals or visions as a, we should set what we'd like to achieve regardless of whether it falls into release engineering or infrastructure. Another bucket. And try to yeah. achieve it, yeah. I don't think they should really be separate because there's, while there isn't always huge crossover in the goals, there's definitely huge crossover in the people trying to reach them. So yeah. I think they should be kind of kept as close as possible. I think so too. <clears throat> and I think it's hard enough to define a five-year goal without worry, you know, without having to worry about separation of duties. Yeah, and there will overlap sometimes. Like if one of our five-year goals was to say, I don't know, move more services towards the cloud, that's going to affect both. It's just, right. especially the broader the scope of your goal, the more likely it is to affect both. Yeah, and I think I think it'll it'll show a lot of inter interdependency and and that the that the resulting the resulting activities will be are they'll be a little bit more of a shared responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. the the con that feeling of of being responsible will, will land on the shoulders of everyone, and there'll be a little bit easier time of, of handing off tasks in both directions. I think the I have is when we work this way. If you focus on migration, for example, to cloud services, you sit within like the knowledge of what applications you run currently and you try to migrate them. And you put a lot of resources into that. And even though like you maybe have issues, you try to solve issues within this set of applications you you're given. You don't try to go outside of it set and said actually because I want to go to cloud, I want to also change the entire usage of that and change the tools we're, we're using. You you feel like it is a way too big of a task for, for your to, to resolve your current problem. So if we focus on, on the, these tasks alone, and it doesn't generate this larger move or evolution of the like whole in release engineering process or infrastructure. And, I'm I'm wondering if we should like have a separate dedicated move into that direction so that it will help in such cases so people don't feel that we are too small to uh create these moves uh, steps by by themselves they are not alone in that and they we can lean on yeah. some larger effort that and that seems to me like something that we would want to do super regularly, like an operational planning meeting, right? Like you'd want to have, I mean, this is a perfect example of that, right? Where we don't, we have, we have sort of minimal documents to read and, and to, to manage for the planning, but then that's effectively what's happening, right? So <clears throat> I think that, I think that's what, I think the thing that's missing is the, is, you know, is effectively the, the documents right now. Right, and that we could be we could be ready to do this in the next meeting cycle. Yeah, like I think today we've discussed a lot of the how and I believe it's too little of the what. Oh, yeah. Um, Alexandra, I didn't hear any of that. It, it yeah. was. <laughs> It never uncompressed. <laughs> so should we go to the uh, Q&A? There's a couple of questions there. Sure. Uh, how can community people help make Relinge slash Infra's job easier without being part of the team? Oh yeah, this was this was earlier. Yeah. Um, hmm. So one thing and i don't know how to communicate this but we wrote up this handy how to interact with our team document that's up on docs and you know it goes through 
it's basically a little checklist flow chart type of thing. You know, you have an issue. Is it a security issue? Uh, can you not log in, et cetera? And it, it tells you what to do. Um, I think if more people followed through that and, you know, basically what it tells you to do is, you know, is it a urgent problem? Okay, tell somebody. If it's not urgent or security or whatever, file a ticket. <laughs> and so, you know, I think that sort of thing helps us um, without the interruptions. But, you know, if you don't know the process, you don't know not to interrupt people. So I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, maybe we should, um, I don't know, periodically post that to discourse, put it as um, the banner on a couple of the IRC slash matrix rooms or something like that. Like, just get it out there. And we do post it at the weekly meeting, but I think sometimes when you see things too regularly, you kind of forget they exist, you get a bit of blindness towards them, yeah. Yep. Uh, also, clear descriptions of problems, but again, this is just the kind of a personal thing. I don't know we can tell everybody to be very clear to describe their problems. Um, uh, one thing that happens a lot in my experience is people say, well, I'm having a problem with Pagare. Okay, are you talking about Pagare.io, source.fedoraproject.org? <laughs> what? Yeah, I don't know. Um, but again, that's something that you just, if you're new, you wouldn't know that, that that's confusing. So it's not even clear that source.fedoraproject.org is a Picar instance, even though it is. So yeah, I, I can't think of anything else for that. I mean, it's impossible to see the dividing line sometimes, right? For new people. I mean, we all have to be trained not to say it's slow. Right. So I think so, uh, there's Oh, go ahead. It, it's a good place to start. And I think the best thing you can we can do is is to have a, you know, a how to ask, you know, a couple of how to ask questions, sessions to to get them to get them more specific. Yep. Uh, so there's another question there. Um, there's increased usage of ETRFS for infra relish servers. How did this come about? Was it requested proactive or reactive? Uh, curiosity feeds certain use cases from an internal or from an internal advocate. Fedora desktop switch some time ago, cloud more recently, were those a factor? Are there any features you're taking advantage of? Um, well, once again, we are reactive. Um, so I've had so much trouble with the 32-bit ARM builders. 32-bit ARM, I'm so glad is going away, but it's still not gone. Um, so about a year ago or so, um, we were having problems with the 32-bit ARM builders were um, crashing, basically. They would oops, kernel oops, and fail the build that they were work working on or restart it or lock up. And oddly, they're doing this again. But um, we actually traced that issue, or we tried a bunch of things without much luck. And um, as I was trying various things, I, I tried a, a ButterFS install, and uh, it actually went away. Um, the issue seems to be a weird XFS issue at 30, with 32-bit, because we were using XFS on them. Uh, so we moved that. And also, there is, for that reason, is, for those builders, but I moved all the builders over, actually, this last time, because uh, the C group handling, I think, is an advantage to us. Uh, also, the compression is probably helpful for builds just because it increases the throughput of things. Um, so it, initially, it was reactive on the 32-bit ARM builders. And then after that, it was just 
there were lots of little advantages uh, over XFS or, or whatnot. Um, so, um, yeah, that's about it. We are once again having a problem with the ARM 32-bit builders, and I think it is the most recent Fedora 36 kernel that's causing the problem. I'm trying to slowly migrate them all to an older kernel to see if that's uh, better, but I haven't looked at them this morning. So, uh, nope, it's just uh, it's just B ButterFS um, and I forget ext4 or xfs for boot. ext4 maybe. Um, but yeah, they're all they're all ButterFS, and uh, I have changed our default Fedora VM. Uh, installs to use that also. So anytime we're reinstalling stuff, like the Koji hubs are uh, ButterFS, uh, the Koji packages are ButterFS, um, but we've kept, of course, all the RHEL stuff is still on uh, XFS. So Yeah, and of course, boot EFI is uh, VFAT, so that's always fun. Uh, let's see. I think that's all the Q&A. So any other questions in the chat? Ask us anything. <laughs> I just wanted to say to Alexandra that I thought the CPE initiatives was a great thing. But I was, I was also thinking that, you know, in terms of the five-year plan, we really want to see the vision and so I think that there's the, the CPE initiatives are like very structured and tend to have a, a, like a, again, a design document. And I think that, you know, we want to, we probably want to expand that more and free, free people from the need to, to create exactly what needs to happen. So uh, one of the things Many years, uh, probably four or five years ago now, uh, I had a goal uh, for one year. Uh, I was going to try and make it so that we didn't need to do infrastructure outages anymore. We didn't need to schedule outages. And the big point of fit or the big thing blocking that is our database servers because, you know, you have to reboot the database server. Um, and I actually had it so that. Um, I had them replicated. I had a, a replication set up so you could reboot one and switch to the other. And I got that all working, except it was a manual process. You had to say, oh, I'm going to reboot the database server. I'm rebooting it. I you know, bring up the, the right thing here and change this from replication mode, et cetera, et cetera. And that just seemed more prone to failure than just rebooting the database server at that point. So I gave up on that. But that's kind of one of the things that I'm thinking of as a long-term goal, where you say, look, we want to make our infrastructure you know, uh, robust enough to where we don't have outages and we can just do a rolling update of things and you know, users don't notice any service change or whatnot. Or another example might be, um, to be able to reinstall all of our staging uh, in like a pretty short period of time and, you know, have it automated. So you could say, boom, take down staging, rebuild it. And once you have that, you could actually use that to deploy another production somewhere else if you wanted to, or other people could use that to deploy a production or something. But I guess those yeah, are more no, like one year goal rather than five year goals because in five years, I don't know if that's still going to be. Well, I mean, I, I think it's a great. I mean, I would, I would probably be more like, you know, maybe we want our applications to have isolated their own isolated copy of the data, right? I, I did the twelve factor app thing right there, you know, so that there's no one app that you go to or one database that you go to that has the the. Um, the final copy it only has the one that's relevant to that service right mm -hmm. and and maybe that's something that we might want to you know we want to carry as a five-year plan as opposed to like yeah high availability is a really good idea and it does provide you that a bit you know that like 
transitional space for your outage infrastructure, but it might be like, I think as we're, so, you know, we're moving things to the cloud. So now fail only architecture kind of becomes a mandate, right? And, and so we want everything to be able to just die and come back. And, and, uh, and that sounds like a five-year goal to me, because there's lots of stuff that's going to be wrong. Lots of stuff we're going to want, you know, council to weigh in on and committees of all sorts um, and teams to take responsibility for, you know, in terms of the infrastructure requirements. I mean, you know, Neil was talking about uh, the cloud team looking at Kiwi and that's, that's a perfect example of that right that's an infrastructure change and ultimately has to you know has to have someone on the infrastructure team who knows what to do with it so i mean i think you know i think those that could fit into a five-year you know there could be a five-year plan for infrastructure that i as as someone who is in the cloud working group look to and say the way that i will design what it is that needs to make our addition better is according to the tenants and the require in the five year plan of the infrastructure team. Right. So I don't want it to just tell me exactly how, I, how I'm supposed to do it. Right. Can't be the design document for every service that never existed yet. It has right. to be, the, yeah, it has to be a vision document. And then, and then eventually it will include some, you know, some, some, technical requirements and those technical requirements we can define on the fly. Right. Right. We'll, we'll do continuous review of the, like the FAQ on how we're getting there and what, what component parts or what hooks we've provided, you know? Right. But I, I see the technical stuff as being the near term to get you to the goal, but you don't have that technical. I don't, I don't say I'm, you know, in five years, I'm going to have a self-healing uh, infrastructure. And in four years, I'm going to have blah, blah, blah. You, you would say, I'm going to have a self-healing infrastructure in five years. And this year I can start working on these things that will get me toward that goal. Yeah. yeah. Because in five That's years, exactly right. it may be, you know, th you, you did some stuff and then next year, some new technology comes along that helps you vastly and you didn't even know about that it existed. And now you can move to that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I've never done a five year plan to survive three years. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, and I think that's reasonable. Yeah. Well, when, when I put that topic there, five years, you know, if you look at the, the rest of it, it's like, is five years realistic? Is three years realistic? Is one year realistic? You know, it, it just depends on what level of technical detail versus vision. Yeah. You know, well, we have to. And if you said, oh, I want a 20 year plan, and the 20 year plan is that uh, I have a Fedora implant in my brain, and, uh, yeah. you know, I can just. Yeah. I think it's okay. I know this sounds stupid, but it's okay to have change your five year plan every three years. It's, it's to provide you direction to a goal rather than say, I'm definitely going to do this yeah. in five years. We, in, uh, you know, in that open source way in our open operations model, right? We have, there's lots of things that help us to make those modifications as we come along, right? We, we, we come across them, right? And, and that's, that's just like management 101 in the, you know, in the open organization. But then the, what I think that, you know, we can, we can really do is we can help to trend set that in ways that, that, you know, makes it possible for people to dream up new, new models. And Leonardo's right. It's a vision. I mean, it's all, it's, you can't write a five-year design document. It just can't be done. And we definitely need to be aware of the Fedora 100 problem. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's a that is a a, a lovely um, sentiment. We we'll just have to. Like I said, I want to be around. Yeah, I want to yeah. be around for the uh, Fedora midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs>
we'll rename it Fedora New and start again at one. <laughs> <laughs> Fedora Red Corvette. <laughs> oh, it has to be a blue Corvette. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Neckbeard, Leonardo, that's the one we really want, Fedora Neckbeard. <laughs> All right, so we got about 15 minutes left. If anyone has a, a final topic. Did we miss any uh, anything we wanted to go over again in the HackMD? I don't think so. I, I wouldn't mind talking actually for a few here about um, the standardization stuff we were talking about earlier. Um, so I was talking about it, or it first came to mind in the context of OpenShift, you know, how OpenShift is a kind of uh, opinionated Kubernetes uh, distribution, right? So it's it kind of gives you a framework and you know that if you're deploying something on OpenShift, all the OpenShifts are deployed the same way. It's like this all, all everywhere. You can count on these things and that's great. But as I pointed out, there's lots of things that you can do differently, like how you create your images and if you continuously deploy or if uh, you, know, you do layered images or, or whatever. Um, so that was the first context where I was thinking of standardization, but it really applies to a lot more than that. Uh, right now, one of the other problems we have with all the apps is they were all designed by you know small groups of people at some point in our history. So if I look at a, an app like Nuancer, which is the application for voting on wallpapers, if you're not familiar with it, you know, that was built by a small group of people many years ago. I have no idea, if I look at this app, I have no idea how to like do a release of it. I, you know, is it just tagging something and uh, creating a tarball and, you know, putting that over as an archive or is there more to it? Who knows? I mean, you know, the people who did the releases are long gone. So having standardization at that level, like, your app, here's how you release a app, or here's how you should release an app if you're doing the standardization. Um, that's, you know, that's another place where things could be standardized. Uh, another place where things could be standardized is uh, our Ansible playbooks who have been written by, you know, 50 people over the last 20 years. And so some people had a style where they did this, and some people had a style where they did that. And so it's very, uh, uneven. It's very, you know, uh, there's no standard indentation. There's no standard style of how you uh, write your plays or anything like that. And, you know, it all works. That's fine. And it's all syntactically correct. But having it be a consistent style helps people, uh, you know, on board easier and uh, know how they're supposed to write stuff and so forth. So those are kind of the areas I was thinking for standardization, but I'm sure there's probably a bunch more. Um, yeah, packaging is uh, an interesting question that actually came up on the infrastructure list fairly recently. Um, in the past, the way we deployed applications was we wrote an application uh, it had a release. We packaged it as an RPM. That RPM was built, deploy, you know, sent, uh, sent as an update to Apple or Fedora, whatever. And then we deployed that that RPM it was the actually the thing that we deployed. However, now in the OpenShift world, that's not actually the case for all our applications. We have applications now that don't deploy that way. Um, let me think of an example. Uh, Noggin, our account system, is actually deployed by uh, Git branch. There's Noggin has a uh, production and a staging branch upstream, 
as well as the regular development stream. And when they want to do a deployment, they push uh, commits to staging and OpenShift sees that, builds an image, deploys it, they can test it, everything's fine. They push a commit to production, it just deploys it. So that is actually not going through the RPM uh, thing. And in some senses, that makes it easier because then the upstream folks don't need to worry about packaging. They don't need to wait, wait for RPMs. They don't need to you know, have delays, et cetera. But other things are lost because then you don't have an easy way for other people to use it or at least you know, uh, easily use it. Uh, you don't have Bugzilla bugs. You don't have uh, all the infrastructure that around Fedora packages where things are, are built, checked to make sure they can install, uh, the dependencies integrated with the rest of the system, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that, that was a discussion on the infrastructure list. You know, should we mandate one or another of these approaches? Uh, and it's really it's really difficult to say because the new style of thing is deploy it from from Git and then you install your dependencies and you're just building on a layer of like Fedora 36 or something like that. So it's a complicated question. I'd love to hear some input from folks. I haven't been following the chat. But... Hmm. I think I'm in the minority here who thinks we shouldn't package everything. I think if it's it's a it's a blocker to some people. They're not used to packaging. Packaging takes a bit of a like there's a learning curve to it, whereas if I can just have a GitHub repo that I can automatically like push to open shift every time I want to cut a release, it's it invites more collaboration. People don't have to worry about the packaging side of it at all. But yeah, it's you're muted there, David. Thanks. Yeah, I think there's definitely some exceptions, you know, like very clear exceptions. And there's a lot of, you know, romance, definitely for sure, around, uh, you know, GitHub actions or or uh, whatever Forge actions. So I know that I know that there's not going to you're not going to get away from it. But um, but I think in in general, it's it's a it would be the best practice, and then. Your, the exception process would be some sort of a review and we move forward because we don't want to get out of line. You don't want whatever's running. We don't want that to get so far out of alignment that we're suddenly stuck on Fedora 36, um, uh, you know, images or containers, right? And, and then they can't move forward and we're suddenly stuck six months later with, with nothing we can support. One of the things that those packages do that's difficult in my mind for the for the packaging side, like Noggin does this, it has, um, I forget the name of the app, there's a GitHub app that basically it checks all your dependencies and then when a, one of your dependencies updates, it says, you know, update your dependency, this day I just updated, I ran CI on it, it's, it's good, it works. But what it does is it basically says, uh, you know, I need this version. I need that version right there, which makes it really, really difficult to package because Fedora has that version over there. And does it work with that version over there? Well, maybe. But the the application itself is saying, I tested with that right there. Um, so it makes it difficult to package it as an RPM unless the application is is uh, open enough to a range of, of versions that are available in the distribution. And you, right, you could get a, get to a case where, you know, upstream moved to this new thing, Fedora hasn't moved to it yet, and you can't install it anymore on, you know, that version. I think poetry is the name of that uh, uh, Python yes. thing, yeah. Yeah, but I think one of my biggest frustrations, you know, is that is that there is such an easy willingness to do that. And I see I see what that looks like, you know, in in I mean, I see it every day, right? In my in day job. And and what one of the things that I see is that there's this willingness to forfeit things that make for compatibility, right? Like 
if you go back and look at the AWS C libraries, there's no shared object names, right? And they're like, why? We're, you're our, your tip of the spear. That's what you do, right? And that's not helpful, right, in, in, uh, in long-term support, you know? I mean... So, and we have that, you know, maybe we don't, maybe we, maybe we're always forward thinking on the one hand, on the other hand, we do still have to consider what are the requirements of long-term support and how do we make sure that that's, that's consistent. It, if we're going to, you know, if we're going to um, make sure that, you know, this is, a, you know, that we're making this a, a relevant experience to a supported operating system, you know, ultimately we're saying, you know, you could use, you can use what we do to build, to build enterprise software. And if what we provide is some way to, you know, leave behind anything that was supportable. I don't know. That we're uh, another thing that uh, started this whole thought process for me on the standardization stuff <clears throat> was that we have some applications. So picture an application it uh, gets deployed. It's deployed on Fedora, a Fedora 36 container in OpenShift. And, you know, the application's there. It's working. Everything's cool. And, you know, there's no real changes to the application. You know, there's there's a few bug fixes, but they haven't done a release yet. And, you know, it's nothing, nothing major. Weeks go by. Months go by. Year goes by that application is still running the Fedora 36 container that was originally deployed when it was originally deployed. There's nothing that made it deploy a newer version or anything. Um, so that's another thing that we're really bad about right now in our OpenShift, uh, things that deploy rapidly or, or often get updated containers, but things that don't or are stable don't update or don't get that updated container. And that's bad. That's, my infrastructure brain does not like that. I want the update. I, you know, I want it all to keep keep working, but I want the latest version to be there. So, that's another thing that we we need to look at doing. I think that maybe the the possibility here is uh, and not to do like a mandatory requirement that for every package uh, app version uh, rpm or or whatever but we could have like what's the, the the goal behind it the goal behind it is to know how to build this thing uh from the sources and not like to have this uh, black box containers which no no one knows what's what's inside and so uh, we would say uh, I, I would say like the the easy way how to make your application compatible is to make an rpm out of it and show that it's possible and then you're done but if you're unable to do that then you enter the uh, next uh, re challenge, which is describe the build process, CI process, and deployment process of your application in such a way that it doesn't look like a black box. And then infra team would be reviewing that manual and saying like, okay, we don't like the detail, the level of details, it go deeper and so on. So we would be saying like, if you do RPM, we don't even look into it. We, we say all good go go but if you're not able to do that then you enter the hard way and then we we have have to deal with that so we're not saying no we're saying this is the easy way and this is the hard one i think um leo kind of brings up a point in the chat there something i was thinking to myself is app developers generally don't care about deployment that's probably a bit of a generalization, but you get what I'm saying. They want their app to work, and it's infrastructure's problem how it's deployed. So they write it for what they want. So I think there's a bit of a, a different uh, stare point where we have to kind of say, mm -hmm. are we going to support them? Or are we going to for them, force them to support us? Or is there give and take? I would say this is where we're kind of, again, should show the leadership role. Uh, like, indeed, in many startup kind of companies where DevOps is a trend, they don't care where the code comes from as soon as it can be packed in container, deployed, and it runs, then no one looks inside and, and we, everyone is happy. But it's actually, it's, it's not a like modern uh, solution. It's a modern problem. 
uh, everyone who does it, they uh, recognize that it's it's not a good way of things. That's that's how like startups live, but no one wants to live this way after one year. And uh, uh, in our case, we would uh, like. I don't want to fight against it completely, but I want us to also push for what's a good thing here, why we're doing it, and to show to people that there were reasons and so on. So I, I wouldn't treat this as a like given. Developers don't care, and this is something we cannot change. I would say this is this happens, but our goal would, should be also to change this trend and to also explain, be not just our Fedora infra, but also be teaching people about good practices. I, I think some of this happens also when apps are first uh, deployed or first land, right? Because then the app comes in and we say, well, okay, here's your app. Can you tell us, how does this work? How do, how do I deploy this, et cetera? So uh, I think we are out of time, but if you guys have any last thoughts, please, uh, please go ahead. Just thank you for organizing this. This was a really interesting session. Yeah, thanks for proposing this, Kevin. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was fun. We should do it more often. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, guys. Yeah. See you. Thank everybody in the chat. Enjoy Nest.